Um, tonight we find Jesus at the, the day after the great miracle that is covered in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. John takes you farther than any other Gospel writer in, in, in the follow-up to this miracle. Most every Gospel, I think we've said this several times, but let's make sure we've, we cover this again so that John's version makes sense. Every Gospel covers the feeding of the 5,000. Not every Gospel covers every miracle. There is a lot that are left out. The fact that the feeding of the 5,000 is in every one, we've, I think we've hit that from every, we've hit it from every angle that I know as to why that is a reality. It is a reality that all five include it. And John does more with it than the other gospel writers. In fact, John builds an entire case around the feeding of the 5,000. We've used his imagery as a way of showing some of the things Jesus might have been trying to accomplish but no other writer bothers to take you to the next day, which is a little shocking considering most of the crowd from the feeding of the 5,000 finds Jesus the next morning and seems to insinuate that they'd like a follow-up miracle, perhaps a breakfast. Now, John doesn't indicate that it's 5,000 people, but it is some of the same crew from the day before. And I find that pretty interesting because, well, if you're going to include the feeding of the 5,000 in your story, which all four Gospels do, it would seem like a follow-up to that event that ends up being one of the most pivotal sermons by Jesus, the great sermon that will end up costing him most of his disciples, would be worth throwing in. So I don't know why the others don't, but I do know John does, and I'm glad for it. The problem with that for our study is that that is yet more material to cover in the same miracle, and I'm finding myself completely unable to get through the sixth chapter, and I thought I would cover an enormous amount of ground today I thought this will be the week where I can really fly towards the end, and I, I, I couldn't because there's some things that happen early in this next day that I, I can't get past in just a passing statement. So we're going to dedicate ourselves tonight to this, what looks like an odd title, I know, Jesus for the sake of Jesus. I promise this will make a bit more sense when we get a little deeper into this lesson, but I... Just as an insight into how I study and why I set these things up the way that I do, if, in case anyone's interested, um, and someone might be, and, and that is that I don't have a plan week to week. I have my Bible in front of me. I know where I stopped. And I know that I've read all of this, I don't want to be silly with my exaggeration, but I've read all of this hundreds of times. And I'm reading it now, and I know what I used to think, and then I know what I'm seeing, and I know where we've been. And so I let all that stuff inform the verse in front of me. And if I can sit down with a pen and my notebook and feel any sort of outline around a verse and then another verse and another verse, then I, I work that outline until there's nothing left to work. If that outline leads to an end game, and that end game has you walking out better informed about Jesus than you walked in, I figure we have a lesson. If I get through a bunch of notes and I don't have an in, a clear end game, it's just a swirling connection of scriptures and stories, but I can't say it all in one sentence if I had to, then I figure we need to do something else. And that's my whole, that's how, why we're on the 40th lesson in the sixth chapter. Because I, I do see that there are a lot of moments where if we would take the time, there's something to be said that has an end game, where you could literally go to your vehicle and say in a sentence or two, here's what I see, here's what I learned tonight. That's far better than, well, it would take me an hour to tell you what he said in an hour. That's not very good teaching. You need to have at least some way of condensing down into a manageable bite what you just heard. Otherwise, you'll never remember any of it. And so it's important then, and, and so I attempted really to do more in this chapter than we've done, but there's so much. And I wanna slow down one more time and I wanna deal with this moment right after this great miracle where Jesus is confronted and Jesus confronts them in return. So let's read our text in John 6, 22. This is a, on the following day, this is the day after the miracle, okay? I almost titled this, the day after, but I see some other things, and so we kind of went a different direction. On the following day, when the, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was 
no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered into the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. Now, I'm, this is a long, almost laborious sentence, big one long sentence we've been dealing with from 22 and 23. And you notice that little breakaway that is the 23rd verse. I'm not going to try to recap. This could have been trimmed down. But I, I, I do have one thing out of these two things, that, out of these two verses that jumps at me. John doesn't recap it by saying anything about the feeding of the 5,000. Look at how John describes the miracle. Other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. And I, that kind of jumps off the page at me because I would have said after the place where the Lord had fed the 5,000. But John doesn't. John says after the place where the Lord had given thanks, which seems like a big time undersell of the miracle, doesn't it? I mean, you fed 5,000 people with two fishes and and five loaves of bread. It seems to me like, uh, I, undersell might not be the right word, but it seems like you could have mentioned the 5,000. Instead, John mentions after the Lord had given thanks. And I don't want to go over that too much, but it is worth remembering that the miracle is a miracle, not because Jesus gets up and proclaims what he's going to do, but Jesus gets up and says, thank you, Father. And boom, people eat. And that's how John saw it too. Because when he tells you what the miracle was, he doesn't mention the fish or the bread or the 5,000 or the people or them eating or them getting full. He mentions one thing, Jesus gave thanks. And that's pretty incredible. And it maybe should be focused on by us as to how we ought to be living our lives. We focus on provision and blessings and numbers and favor and stuff and people and events. And John focused on give thanks. And so the miracle is best summarized as the day Jesus gave thanks. And I am impressed with that. And I, I, I wanted to at least bring it up. And, and I thought about staying there for a long, long time, but I won't. But just I'll let you marinate that in your spirit. I think it's pretty cool. Okay, 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into the boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. This tells you that Capernaum is the destination. It was on the far side of Tiberias, which, by the way, is the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias is more of a John version, late first century version of the Sea of Galilee. So Capernaum is the destination. They go to Capernaum seeking Jesus, 25. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Rabbi is just a great word for teacher. Sort of an ancient word for teacher. When did you come here? 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. So there's, there's the key that's sort of going to be the heartbeat of this lesson tonight. Jesus says to them, because they say to him, How did you get here? We didn't see you leave. We watched your disciples get on a boat. But we, you didn't get on a boat. We watched. This tells you they've been waiting on Jesus all night. We didn't see you get on a boat. You and I know, because we just did this last week, that Jesus doesn't take a boat. Jesus walks on the water. They didn't see him walk on the water. Jesus materialized to his disciples. Kind of tells me that maybe he didn't, it, it wasn't with fanfare that he walked on the water. Or at least nobody else saw him do it but the disciples. And he says, you guys are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. In other words, you're not really seeking me. You're seeking my byproduct. You're seeking what I can do for you. I fed you yesterday. You're here today so that perhaps I'll feed you again today. 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. <clears throat> Next screen. Let's pose some questions and some thoughts. Let's examine our motives for meeting Jesus. This is really our kickoff point for tonight because the story is familiar. I mean, everybody, we've worked the feeding of 5,000 up one side and down the other. And most of you knew where this story was going because you know that John sends you to the other side and you know that the crowd follows him and you know that they want another miracle. So let's go where we may not. Let's go, let's talk about what we may not be thinking about, what we haven't really considered. Let's examine our motives for meeting Jesus. Augustine remarked how seldom, this is August, Augustine of Hippo, early church scholar father, remarked how seldom Jesus is sought for the sake of Jesus. I put that in quotes because that's his quote. Seldom Jesus is sought for the sake of Jesus. That was 
I based my title off of that tonight because that moved me when I was studying this. How rare is it that we seek Jesus for the sake of Jesus, who he is? What would be the converse of that? If that's not what we're doing, then what might we be doing? Well, many of us came to Christ for what he could do for us. How many of us came to Jesus because we wanted to get to know the greatest man that ever lived or that we wanted the life of God living through us? The answer to that, and I'm not, it's not fair for me to answer for you, but I'll answer a generalized answer, having spent a few decades in the church. Not very many of us came to Jesus so that we could live the life of God. Not very many of us came to Jesus because we wanted to meet the greatest version of man that had ever lived. Almost none of us came to Jesus because we think we'd found the last Adam that represented all of us. Almost all of us came to Jesus to get out of something or get something we didn't think we had. And we were motivated by a list of stuff, perhaps fear, perhaps ignorance, perhaps, and most of it was fear, let's be honest, because a lot of people came to Jesus out of fear. Somebody scared hell into them and then attempted to save it right out of them. That was the whole gospel message. We're going to scare hell into you if you haven't sufficiently been scared of it. And then we're going to go to work trying to get as much of it out of you as we can. And we're also going to give you equipment to try to subdue the hell that you have in your life. That's going to be religion for you for the rest of your life. And you'll never really get rid of all of it but you can try to suppress it. And uh, that, was a, that was a journey. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, the road to exhaustion. So I don't know for you. I, I, don't, I don't know why you came. And it would probably, well, it wouldn't probably, it would be pretty awesome to go around the room and find out why we all came to Jesus. But I, I got a feeling that it would, they would be very similar. And if we were honest, we would say, well, because I thought this was going to happen to me, or I was told this is my destiny, or this is my future, and which tells you that you entered into a relationship out of horrific fear. There's not another relationship in your life that you would consider healthy if you entered into it with that kind of a first date. If the first date that you went on, the other side of the table motivated you with fear, torture, and punishment, you would run, and then you would sue. But unfortunately, the version that has been pitched in the American church is that we go on that first date, and we are pitched with fear and torture and punishment, and then we pay for the privilege to come on a second date. And we continue to shell out as much as we have to, hope, hoping that we can somehow assuage the grief and guilt that is beginning to swallow us every day. And then we're not a whole lot unlike the beach crowd on the day after the feeding of the 5,000 because they approach the same Jesus who is miraculous and good and wonderful the day before. He is great. He, is, he can do anything. And he just proved it. And they love him for it. And who wouldn't? Because that's a miracle that you should write down if you're going to write a gospel. And they all do. And if you can give me dinner, why can't he give me breakfast? Particularly in a world where my next meal is not guaranteed. And I can't go fire up the microwave and fix last night's leftovers and go to the corner grocery store and buy something quick and easy. My meals are planned seasons in advance. My crops and my animals, I, I don't just come up with something. I either have it or I know I'm going to die. My, I, it's not a matter of maybe we'll eat tomorrow. It's we're not going to eat for two weeks unless this miracle happens. We don't even understand this world. Frankly, I don't even know how much we should be talking about their world because we're like aliens compared to them and we don't have any of their, their, their context. And the best we can do is to say, God's done amazing things for you that you didn't deserve and that you didn't pay for and you love him for it. And then you expect more of it tomorrow. And that's as good as we've got. That's as close as we can get to that. And so I apologize that I can't come up with a better illustration than, than they're living out. But it's, that's as big as it gets. And they show up wanting more. And Jesus says, don't, and how can he say, don't labor for the meat that, that, give me that. Is that my next screen, 27? Yeah, don't labor for the food that perishes. 
but for the food that endures everlasting life. The, I, I read, I tried to read this with a completely new lens this week and, and not as if I'd ever read it before. And when I did that and I threw off what I knew was coming, which is not easy to do, by the way, as a student, because you know what's coming. And so it, it, it colors where you are in the text because you, well, this is coming to you. And that's healthy. You need to know what's coming. It does help. But if you try to get rid of that, I go, I don't know what's coming. Let's just read this, very, this verse on its face. On its face, this is cruel. Because you live in a world where you don't know where your next meal is. And Jesus goes, don't labor for the meat that perishes. Labor for the everlasting life. And you go, well, how would you tell people not to worry about their next meal? All they do is live their lives worrying about their next meal. And so on the face, it's a really difficult verse until you start to know the context and the setting behind it. And that led me to this thought. Jesus isn't condemning work. Jesus is contrasting two ways of life, two approaches to God. He's contrasting the way in which seeking Jesus for what you can get in the natural or seeking Jesus for who you could be in the spiritual. And those are not the same things. Look at them closely. They sound similar, but they're not the same. One is you seek Jesus for what you can get in the natural realm. The other is seeking Jesus for who you could be in the spiritual realm. And I really, that I, I, I oversimplified it and I wanted another one. But I didn't want to get too complex, but it's oversimplified because in reality, we're not only becoming something in the spirit realm. What we're becoming in the spirit realm is having a great effect on who we are in the natural realm. Admittedly, there should probably be a third one in which we seek him for who we could be in the spiritual. And it directly affects what we have in the natural. But my point is that Jesus isn't condemning people because they need to go buy groceries. Jesus is saying... I believe what Jesus is saying is that, listen, you can labor for what you can get your hands on in the natural, or you can believe for what you can't touch in the natural, which only comes in the supernatural. So it's the difference in coming to Jesus for what he has to, for what a difference he can make in who you are versus coming to Christ for what he might be able to do in your life. And that's a drastic difference. It's enormous. It's, it's so big that it's the verse we opened with the first four, five, six lessons. And it's this verse, John 20, 31. Remember this? These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. I want you to leave that up for a moment because although that's way up in 20, that's the heartbeat of the book of John. John was writing all of this stuff down so that you would believe that Jesus is who He said He was the anointed Son of God, and that by believing it, you would have life. Not that by believing it, all your stuff would be solved, or that all your sicknesses would go away, or that all your bills would get paid, or that all your chaos would end, but that you would taste and touch and handle the life of God in this earth. And that's John's whole point. So let me introduce you to a man who, if you got to know him, would the natural realm be affected? Absolutely. But what would be more important is you would handle the life of God. You would, be, you would grasp who God is, and then you'd live that out on the earth. And then what a difference you might be able to make if you did that. And so I see John is doing something big. Next screen. John's gospel is pushing against 1,500, actually more than 1,500 years of Jewish history. Because Israel's familiar with the God who quote-unquote moves, but they don't know much about God's heart. Jesus came doing, quote unquote doing, so that Israel would recognize him. But he's constantly challenging them to only believe. And so everywhere Jesus goes, he does something in the natural, primarily for Jews. And for a long time, I, I saw a dichotomy in Jesus. I saw Jesus as doing stuff for Jews because they were his heart. I'm going to give you an insight into my my evolution as a student of who Jesus is, okay? For a long time, I saw Jesus is blessing and healing Israel, Jewish people. And then a Gentile sneak into the story once in a while, and Jesus is real reluctant. You're like, ah, I don't know about this cat. And I would say, well, Jesus is there for Israel, and he can't be, he can't, he don't want to be distracted from his mission from Gentiles. Okay maybe. I don't, I don't know that I buy that, really, at this stage in my journey. As much as I believe 
that Jesus was always doing for Israel because it's the only way they knew God. He parts Red Seas. He turns rocks into bread. He, he sweetens bitter waters. He, it's, he makes bread show up on the ground. There's bread and quail, and it's called manna. And, and uh, he drowns Egyptian armies in waters, and he stops the flow of the Jordan, and he got to do all this stuff. Gentiles had never knew that God. For Gentiles, I mean, Jesus doesn't have to do anything. They're the first ones that go, just speak the word, my servant will be healed. I mean, you just, yeah. you just I don't know, just say it. That's how God works, right? You watch Gentiles, they're, they're ignorant. We might call them stupid. They don't ever come quoting scripture and they don't have a lot of history. And they're saying stuff like, I don't know, just say the word. And they're using secular illustrations like, I'm a man of authority. I say to one soldier, go, and he goes. I say to another one, get over here, and he gets over here. I figure if you say it, it'll happen. It's completely unscriptural. It's not holy at all. It's tainted with violence and, and wickedness and hierarchies of the world. And Jesus grins and says, I've never seen faith like that in Israel. Why? And we always stop there. Why haven't I seen faith like that in all of Israel? Well, we don't get the next verse, but you get it if you read the, the body of work, what Jesus is saying. The reason I don't see that kind of faith in Israel is you guys have always had to have me part Jordans and Red Seas and drown Pharaohs and turn rocks into bread. You won't believe it unless I do something fantastic. And that this guy thinks if I just said it, it could happen. Because why not? Because that's how things work. And so I don't really think Jesus is doing great things for Israel and just a little bit for Gentiles because his heart's Jewish and then the rest of you will get it after the cross. No, I believe that Jesus is responding in exactly the way people believe he needs to do it. And so for a lot of Israelites, it's you got to touch and you got to move and you've got to do. And for a lot of Gentiles, it's just, hey, man, if there's a crumb left over, can I eat it? That's what the Syrophoenician woman says. Can I, I mean, there's a crumb left over, I can have a crumb. I mean, a crumb will work. I don't have to have a whole loaf. I think a crumb's enough to heal my kid. And Jesus goes, you got it. There it is. That's all I was ever trying to do. Just, just trying to throw some crumbs out there so you would get it. And then they believe and they receive. And that isn't happening the morning after the feeding of the 5,000. And this is where Jesus wants to take them is into that other direction. So they're familiar with the God. Israel's familiar with the God that does. They don't know much about the heart of God. Jesus comes doing so they'll recognize him. And here's an Old Testament verse that'll kind of start to explain this. Psalms 103.7, very simple sentence. He made known his ways to Moses. He made known his acts to the children of Israel. Take a look at what those words are. The word ways here in the Hebrew is a mode of action, or this is an interesting word to me. The word ways is the, the Hebrew word for take a journey, to go down a road and to to, to, it's almost like an adventure. Can you go back? Just one, ver one screen. So I want you to think about the definitions when you see this verse, okay? He made known his, he made known his journey to Moses. It's almost like he went, you and I are going to go down the road together. You go on a journey with somebody, you get to know them. It's like you get locked in a car with somebody and drive three days to the other coast. You get to know whether you want to be friends anymore. You know? <laughs> Because all the, at some point in the journey, the frivolities and the kindnesses and the niceties pass away. And the real you starts coming out in, hopefully, in roses and lavender. <laughs> but most likely in chaos and torture and torment is probably what, most of, what mostly happens. So he made known, his, made known that journey. And then he made known his acts to Israel. So now go back to the next screen. Acts in the Hebrews, deeds or works. It's really what you think it is. It's the stuff you do. So God let Moses in on the journey. He let Moses in on the why. I don't even really know why I put that in. I, it was one of those moments where I put it in and then later when I'm looking at my notes, go, what was I thinking when I did that? And I had to kind of dwell on that sentence for a while and think that I think what I think the reason that hit me quickly when I was taking these down was that he let Moses in on the whole reason we're doing this thing. I'm not going to let Israel in on that. I'm going to let you in on that, Moses, because people close to me get to know the why. That's kind of like, that's, people close to you get to know the why for you. Why are you doing this? Well, you have the right to say to people, that's none of your business, right? 
It's like, why, why are you doing this? That's none of your business. You're not close enough to me to have the right to get my why. My why is special. My why is my meaning. But if you're close to me, you can get, you can get my why. And if I give that to you, it's because I believe that you could be part of the why. Right? Otherwise, you should hold on to that. We're a very odd society in that. And I think it's because we're so, we, we think we're media savvy. I, somebody in an interview this week, and a reporter, it was a young lady, pop star, and the reporter said, are you, are you going to take some time off to go have a baby anytime soon? And I thought, she should say to that reporter, that is absolutely none of your business. You should never ask another human being that. Is, it is, that is completely private. And the reporter probably would have, you know, and cried and felt like they were being persecuted. But the reality is, is that you don't ever have to let anybody on in your why. Well, it's nobody else's business. This is who I am. So God knows he doesn't have to let anybody on, on the why. And yet he lets Moses in. Moses knows his ways. Israel just knows his acts. He shows Israel the externals. And then this little nugget, because this is important. The fact that he shows Israel the externals is their choice, not his. Because I don't believe it was God's heart to not give his why to everyone. He wanted to give his meaning to every person that wanted to know it. it was, it's the heart of God to give that why to everyone. Here's why I say that. Exodus 19.1. I, I give you a couple more verses than you need, okay? I, I just want to show you the context of this. In the third month after Israel had gone out of Egypt, 90 days were out of slavery. That's all we are. 90 days. On the same day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Now, you know what's coming, again, because you, you're in the middle of a story you've heard 50 times in your life. So you know Sinai is not going to end well. But act like you don't know that. Because they don't know that. Okay? They're three months out of Egypt. What's, there's nothing bad in the whole wide world. We're three months out of Egypt. Life is good. God's doing great things. They had departed from Rephidim. They came to the wilderness of Sinai. They camped in the wilderness. And so Israel camped there before the mountain. All is well. So Moses goes up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, here's what you need to say to the house of Jacob. Here's what I want you to go tell the children of Israel. Okay, you ready? This is what I want you to say to them. Go back and tell them this. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. How I bore you up on angels' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you're going to be a special treasure to me above all people because all the earth is actually mine. It all belongs to me anyway. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, these are the words which you need to go speak to the children of Israel. Catch that phrase at the top of the screen. You shall be a kingdom of priests. And we've said this before, so let's say it again. What's a priest? It's a representative of the earth to God. What's a prophet? A representative of God to the earth. God didn't say, I'm going to make you a nation of prophets. He said, I'm going to make you a nation of priests. You get to represent yourself to me, all three million of you. Go tell them, Moses. This is going to be a great experience. Them and me, together at last, brought them out of Egypt, bore them up on eagle's wings. I own the whole earth, and I'm going to make a nation out of them. And they all get to be a priest. Every one of them get to have the right to represent themselves. Individual liberty, freedom that the world had never seen before. They all get to come to me and show themselves worthy in front of me. Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 to 21. Now all the people witnessed thunderings and lightning flashes and the sound of a trumpet and the mountain smoking. And the, when the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. And they said to Moses, you speak with us and we'll hear, but don't let God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, don't fear. God's come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood far off. But Moses went into the thick darkness where God was. 
and the entire tone of the Old Testament changes now. God's offer was, welcome to Sinai. I brought you out of Egypt and I bore you on eagle's wings. The whole earth is mine. You're going to be a bunch of priests. Now we're going to have a meeting. I'm going to start with Moses on the mountain and we're going to meet. Moses, you go tell them to get themselves ready. Okay, buddy, you get them ready. You and I will talk and then it's on. And when they watch it from a distance, their heart turns to stone and to fear. And rather than going and having their own conversation with God, they call Moses off to the side and go, from now on, you talk to God for us. We don't want to talk to God. God's scary. And Moses goes, don't be scared. Why would you be scared? God's not going to bring you out here and kill you. We all get to talk to him. They go, no, no, no. We'll stand way over here. You go talk to the Lord. Israel surrendered relationship for security. My parentheses there, liberty. I'll come back to that. Israel surrendered relationship for security. It could be because Moses had misrepresented God from the beginning. Could be. Take intimacy and relationship away, and you have a God to fear rather than a God to embrace. Just stay on that for a moment. Think about this with me, if you would. Moses is the liaison between the God he's met and the God they don't yet know. All they know is he's taken us out of Egypt and he bore us up on, e on eagle's wings. And Moses has seen God. And Moses knows that the top of the mountain shakes and trembles. And Moses has an opportunity to go back down and present God in the right way to Israel. What happened? We skipped a bunch of stuff, didn't we? We skipped. We had 19 where God goes, I'm going to keep a bunch of priests. And we jump all the way deep into 20 and Israel's freaking out. Well, what we skipped was the possibility that Moses is misrepresenting God to the people and creating in them a, a, a disproportionate fear, the kind of fear that causes a man to surrender his relationship for security. And by his relationship, I mean his freedom because he was going to get to be his own priest in front of God. He gave up a piece of his liberty so that he could stand far enough away from the mountain that he was guaranteed nothing bad happened to him. And so he, in some, in some sense, he trades the intimacy of proximity for the cold distance of security, like someone who will not enter into a relationship for fear that the relationship will go south and they'll get hurt. So it's easier to have no relationship at all and stand way off in the darkness because you may not be intimate with anybody, but at least your heart's not broken. And that psychology has run deep through the mind of man. I'm not saying it started here. Maybe it happens here because it runs deep in the heart of man that we go, you know, it's just far safer to stay as far away from the possibility of problems as we can. And we deprive, our, we do this to our kids when we don't push them out into a troubled world. Because we think I'm going to keep them sheltered instead of letting them go into a troubled world because a troubled world might kill them. You're right, it might kill them. It also might give them a chance to slay a dragon bigger than themselves and find out that they're worth something on the earth. Something they'll never learn if they're not pushed out into the world. And so there's, there's always a give and take that happens there. But I, I kind of got off on that rabbit there for a moment. But let's take a look at what might have happened how, how I think perhaps Moses misrepresented God. Let's go back into the middle of those. Exodus 19.10. Remember, we went with the top six verses of Exodus 19 a moment ago, where God goes, you guys get to be priests. And the Lord says this to Moses in verse 10. Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. What God tell Moses to tell them to do? Wash their clothes. It's a really basic command. It's a cleanliness verse. Just tell them, go clean up. We're going on a date. You sharpen up before you go on a date, right? Go slap on a little cologne, you know, wash yourself off a little bit. Make yourself presentable. Go tell the people, make themselves presentable. This is how we're going to converse. They make themselves presentable. I'll make myself presentable. It's going to be a wonderful and a great union of people. Let them be ready for the third day. On the third day, there's an image that's going to drag itself into the new covenant. Third day beauty. Okay, you're, going to get, you're going to get Jesus come bursting out of a tomb, white linen and clean on a third day. It's God presenting himself on a third day to his people. For on the third day, the Lord's going to come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. 12. 
You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you don't go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. God isn't killing anyone here. He's not even really threatening anyone with death here. He's saying there's a certain parameter between who I am and who they are. I want you to teach them to clean themselves and put themselves at that fence. I'm going to come down to them. I don't take this verse as God's... I take this verse as I, I want to approach them. I take the responsibility of coming down the mountain to them. Don't let them come up the mountain to me. Because if they're climbing the mountain to me, that's how they're going to feel like they always have to approach me. I'll come to them. This is a pretty good date. Go clean yourself up. I'll pick you up. Right? You don't come to me. I come to you. So I'll pick you up. Whoever touches the mountain, be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. And this is a, this is a pre-shadow for what Sinai ultimately becomes and how the law ultimately gets viewed because of, this is going to be a bad relationship out of the gate that's about to happen. 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people. Watch this carefully with me. Watch this, watch this play itself out. Moses comes down the mountain to the people, sanctified the people. He just does that verbally because that's to set something aside. So he basically sets them up and goes, you're special people. You guys are going to be priests. You stay down here at the mountain. God's going to come visit you. Clean yourselves up. Wash your clothes. This is exactly what God told him to say, right? If he had only stopped talking. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Don't come near your wives. And there's a real blasting red five alarm fire that should be flashing in your spirit right here. God, first thing that you ought to think is, God didn't say anything about not sleeping with your spouse. Moses has thrown it in because Moses has made the classic religious error. A little bit is good. A lot would be better. So if a little bit goes a little ways, what would a lot do? So if, a, if cleaning yourself was good, what if you abstain from anything at all? What if you cut off? Now, literally, Moses says, don't go have sex with your spouse. But it's way deeper than that. Because why does Moses think that's a bad thing? Because for Moses, consecration and sanctification is to completely cut yourself off from everybody else because everybody else can only taint you. They can't help you. They can only worsen you. And so Moses comes down and goes, cut off all relationships with other people and wait only on God. And that's a problem. And your spirit ought to be screaming out, something's wrong here if people are trying to cut me off from my relationships. And I think that's exactly what's happening in Israel. I think her spirit is screaming out because someone has cut her off from the intimacy of the people she loves. And then, if remember our text from 20 when they go, you go tell God that he, he, you and him need to do all the talking. We don't want to do any of the talking. And Moses goes, wait, wait a minute, why are you guys so afraid? And I think it's because Moses added things to the word of God that were never supposed to be there. And he added a tragic, tragic element to the law. He actually made them believe that by cutting off intimacy and relationship corporately, they would be suitable vessels for God. And the church has done that to this day. That somehow isolationism will make you more susceptible to the anointing. I grew up in a church culture where I remember, I remember preachers would come through, evangelists, and they didn't want to be talked to before the service. You know, like, and I, and like, you, they didn't want to talk about the service or about the, I look back now and I think, some of them probably genuinely had the idea that they'd be more anointed. Some of them were just jerks. And they had found a good spiritual reason to not talk to anybody for a couple hours before the service or afterwards, you know. This is the guy that has to get escorted in after the music starts because you don't want people brushing up against him and rubbing off their anointing. All that foolishness as if they have some special thing in their skin that soaks up the anointing and then, and then shoots it back out if people rub up against them. <laughs> foolishness. And yet you see Jesus hobnobbing and elbowing and hugging people and putting his fingers in dirt and spitting on the ground and all the stuff that would run the anointing right out of my charismatic churches. 
And yet Jesus is doing all of that because for God, there was no such thing as you cutting off relationship with other people so that you could be closer to God. That's satanic and frightening. See, this is a marriage relationship Israel and God are having. Everything I just gave you was dating imagery. Go home, clean yourself up. Don't come to me, I'll come to you. I'm going to come pick you up. And then Moses drops on them the lack of intimacy. And who wants that for the rest of their lives? Who wants that kind of relationship where there's no intimacy? And I think Israel drags that into their encounters with God all the way up to the time of Jesus. Jesus comes and he's intimate, man. He's intimate. He's touching stuff and hugging people and loving. And that's standoffish because that's not the kind of relationship they've had. Here's a couple thoughts about this in a practical sense. When marriage loses its spark, now it's going to sound like I'm talking about only about natural marriage. I am talking about that, but I'm, we're referencing something greater, okay? Well, we're referencing something spiritual, not something greater. It's a bad choice of word. Where marriage loses spark, passion, and intimacy, it's left with a business arrangement. Because neither person's pursued for who they are, but they're pursued for what they have to offer. And this was the end result of Israel's relationship with God. Jesus arrived at the end of a long drought of intimacy between Israel and God. So much so they couldn't even recognize God in Jesus when Jesus showed them God. They didn't know what that God looked like because that's not the husband they've known for 1,500 years or a couple of millennium. And that was never God's heart, but that's exactly what they've done. And I, I don't want to blame it all on Moses, but Moses coming down and saying, you know what would make you really holy? Don't go home and sleep with your spouse. That'll make you really holy. And red flags come up and say, who wants that kind of a relationship? And so Israel surrenders God's journey and chooses God's stuff. Because all they have left is a business relationship. And in a business relationship, it's not about the journey. If you and I are in business together, we don't have to sit down and talk about the journey, but we are going to talk about the contract and the payments and what I get out of it and what you get out of it. Now, I don't need to know your emotions about what you get out of it. I don't need to know your journey. I don't need to know, your, I don't need to know how this, this business transaction makes you feel. I don't care how it makes you feel. I care that you make the payments, that you do what you were contracted to do, this is why we've made this statement. This isn't personal. It's just because we know business is a notch lower. That's why we say it's just business. It's not personal. It's just business. It's only business. Our emotions don't need to enter into it. You and I aren't getting intimate. We're just making payments here, man. I'll do what I said I would do. You do what you said you would do. The journey belongs to other people. The journey belongs to the spouse. The, the journey belongs to people who get to be intimate with each other. In a marriage relationship, that, that intimacy is sexual and non-sexual. In a relationship between friends, that intimacy can be hopes and dreams and passions and humor in your heart. And, and in fellow believers, man, it's a beautiful thing because it can be everything you were and everything you are and everything you hope to be and you get to share all of that and that's you sharing that journey and everything else is just business. Now for a lot of us, our Christianity is just business. I pay my 10% and God blesses me. That's business. Don't get your heart involved in it. In fact, it's how we took up offerings. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. It's being obedient. God said, give it, and he'll give you back. Guess what? It's just business. Now, nobody got up and said that, but it's exactly how it worked if you pitched it as just business. It worked because we all understood that. Intimacy not required. Remember a couple weeks ago on our Sunday meeting when we preached how did Jesus fulfill the law? And I just started taking you into all these moments where Jesus comes and he's like, you got to love people. That's the whole, that's the fulfillment of the law. Jesus was an alien to them because Jesus comes along and makes everything personal and nothing business. And that's offensive to religion. Because once things become personal, people are involved. And when people get involved, then their heart's involved. And you can't just smash their heart because this isn't just business anymore. You got to love them. And that's what caused people to go, well, well you know, should we, oh, how should we treat people that are mean to us? I mean, because just business, we ought to be able to hit them back, right? And that's, that's the whole message of the new covenant is that Jesus took it beyond just business and said, no, 
Jesus. This is a relationship. Oh, all that's well and good, Jesus. But just show us the Father. Can you imagine how frustrated Jesus was? He goes, guys, how long we got to do this? You know, well, we're probably going to have to do it a long, 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 long time because we don't have a, a backstory for Israel. We don't have a backstory of a relationship with God. And that's all you've been pitching for three and a half years in your ministry. How are we supposed to know you're what the Father looks like? To us, the Father's a guy that the mountain burns with fire and we don't get intimacy. I don't think it was the heart of God. And I don't want to throw stones at Moses, but I think he dropped the ball. And God is so, God adjusts so much to our foolishness and the things that we do that are wrong. We go on a journey to try to find him and it takes forever to get there. And I think we're still on it. I think we're still on that journey. John 6, 26. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, because you ate the loaves and you were filled. Don't labor for the food that perishes, for the food which endures everlasting life. The Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. God, God's a Father, and he has sealed me over. I'm his son, so I get to be a representative of my dad. And you, I don't, you don't... Listen, if you're going to get to know my dad, you're going to have to know that it's not just what my dad can do for you. My dad wants to know you. Okay? If it's all about just what he can do for you, you can bring me some more bread and fish, we can have breakfast. And then you're going to come back for lunch and you're going to need more because all you need is a miracle. That's all you want is a miracle. I'm a slot machine to you. I'm Santa Claus. But my dad's better than that. Dad's put his seal on me. He wants a relationship with you. He's a father. I call him father so you can call him father. This is what Jesus, he's saying a lot right here. And hopefully you can see that. I know you're looking at it and going, none of that, that's not all there. But yeah, it is. I mean, it, it is there because it, you walk your whole history into the room. And they do too. And so they walk it all to Jesus. And he says, God the Father has set his seal on him. 28, we didn't read this early. They said to him, what shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Now, I was really torn right here. This is supposed to be where I stop because this is such a big moment. I think it needs its own week. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the couple, I'm going to give you a couple verses on this. And I'm going to see how it settles with me this week. Okay, and if I'm settled that I don't need to do more, then we'll move on to another, we'll further ourselves into John 6. And if I'm not settled and I stir on it for seven days, then we'll be right here next week. They say to him, what shall we do? that we may work the works of God. 29. Jesus answered, this is the work, that you believe on him whom he had sent. And so their question is, we want to do the right thing. What's the right thing look like? And Jesus says, this is it. Just believe on the one whom the Father sent. Who's the Father sent? Well, according to the previous verse, Father has set his seal on me. I'm the Son of God. So believe on me. And you do in the works of the Father. So I wanted to give you one comparative verse. Let's see how this settles with us. Matthew 7, 21. Remember this one? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Well, this gets quoted a lot. I tell you what, some of you coming to Sunday school and you've been paying your tithe. But I tell you this, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord's going to make it into heaven. Just because you think you're saved doesn't mean you're really. Anybody else that come up under that kind of preaching? My God, I was scared I was going to hell all the time. Yeah. Just because you think you're saved, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord's going to make it into heaven. That verse doesn't even say that, but it sure was all they needed. Because the <laughs> kingdom of heaven and a place called heaven are two different things, by the way. But uh, that's for another sermon. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So I ask you, what's the will of the Father? Nobody ever said this when they were condemning me to hell with their old-time preacher voice. Nobody would really elaborate because everybody would go, the will of the Father is that you get saved. And then there was like 30 other things on it. And you get baptized with the Holy Ghost and you go out and win the lost. And you, you know, the Hammond organs rolling, and running back and forth on the platform. And... And then I get to John 6, and they ask Jesus essentially the same question. They go, 
what do we got to do to do God's works? Or what do we got to do to do the will of God? Jesus goes, doing the will of God is believe on the one that God has sent. That's the will of the Father. When Jesus says, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord's going to enter the kingdom, he's talking to Israel. This is Matthew. This is, this is a book straight to Jews of the first century. It, 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 its entire eschatological package is wrapped up in the fall of the temple. It's coming in AD 70. And the whole book is rushing headlong towards it. And Jesus is warning them at every turn. And he goes, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord's going to make it into the kingdom. The kingdom's me. I'm bringing the kingdom with me. And you're going to have to come out the other side through me. And there's only one way to do that. Do the will of the Father which is in heaven. John 6, beach, next day, after the feeding of 5,000. What's the will of the Father look like? Believe on the one whom the Father sent. Who's the one the Father sent? Jesus. How do you get into the kingdom? Go through the king. Who's the king? Jesus. Where's the kingdom? You're in it. And he says to Israel prior to his crucifixion, the kingdom's here. You can't touch it. It's not by observation. It's in the middle of you. But you're not getting in unless you go in through the way of the Father. And what's the way of the Father? Do his will. What's his will? I'm his will. That's why John 14, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus doesn't say no man goes to heaven but by me. We co-opted that as a way to make fun of other religions. Jesus says you'll never know God as your dad unless you meet Jesus. Oh, you'll know God. You might know the version of God that won't let you sleep with your spouse or touch a mountain. But you'll know him. But if you want to know him as your father or you want to know him as your husband, or you want to have an intimate relationship with him, you're going to have to come through the only person standing on the planet that knows what he looks like, Jesus says. And that's Jesus. And that's knowing him as Father. So 6.30, John 6.30. Therefore they said to him, Oh gosh, this is the dumbest verse in the New Testament. <laughs> I don't know any other, I can't church it up. This is the dumbest question anybody has ever asked any person that's ever been alive, ever, anywhere on the planet, in any language or any time. You just took a kid's lunch and multiplied it and fed 5,000 men, maybe 10,000, 15,000 people, and you left 12 baskets of fragments left over. And all you did to make it happen was look up and say thank you. And their question is, could you do a sign so that we'll see it and believe you? What work will you do? And I don't blame Jesus if he just turns around and walks away. Just goes, forget it. You know, I'm done. I'm done. I'm just, and just walks on water right back across the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> Sprays him. Yeah, rooster tails his way out of there. I'm going to leave this for next week, okay? I don't know what we'll do with it. I don't know if I can do anything more with it. It's a question that infuriates me. I don't have a lot to teach on this, except to say we're still pulling this foolishness with God all the time. And if you don't think so, that's where we're open next week because we do this every time we get on our knees and we talk to the Father. We say something dumb like, hey, could you prove that you still love me could really use a miracle over here. And I think more than once, God's got to say, how many times do I have to multiply bread and fish for you? And I'll end where we ended last week. And it's called, they didn't believe because they didn't have a revelation of the provision. And that's the problem. Father, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful journey. Thank you for this time in the word and how exciting and how fun Thank you for reiterating in us that the word is full of beauty and the end game is to walk out of here and hope that we walk in relationship and not religion and let this seed, let this happen in us. There's a lot of info you put in us to put into the people tonight and Hopefully we can find a way to condense that down. Help us to all to do that. Let us in on the journey. Let us in on the journey, not just the works. In Jesus' name, amen.